Wow. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons I agree to come up and do things like this is I'm really kind of curious what the, what youth are talking about. Um, it's not like I'm that young anymore, to tell you the truth. But, um, those times were different for two reasons. One, the period of the 60s was a time of movement. You know, civil rights movement, women's movement, um, the, you know, the issue of, of uh, the war. All of these things were currents of huge social changes. And the advantage that young people at that time had is that you couldn't escape in my view. The second thing that was totally different that I thank God you can't imagine is that for young men and the women who cared about them, you had to make a choice often about life and death, whether or not you were going to go to Vietnam. So if I dropped out of school, it was also knowing that I was going to have a draft physical and uh, could be, you know, in Vietnam tomorrow. So that was a pressure, a decision point that almost everybody had to make if they were going to be politically active or not. Um, you know, and for all the controversy about how dangerous a sport football is, no question in my mind, it saved my life. I mean, sixth game, my senior year, clipped on my knee, had a Joe Namath knee, and you know what? I was trained by the Boston Draft Resistance Group when I left school, and I organized draft resistance in the, the first year I was out. And they can't make you have an operation. America, what a country. They can't make you have an operation. So I had this knee that desperately needed an operation. I had a letter from Ochsner Hospital in New Orleans saying, get this boy down here and give him an operation. And it would get to, I did four, four or five, draft physicals over the years before I was 26, and we get to that point, they would have already had their hands up my butt and everything else, but it comes to that point where you've got to do deep knee bends. And I would just stand up as straight as the day is long, and I wouldn't do those deep knee bends, because I had this bad knee. And what I didn't like about draft counseling as opposed to regular organizing is essentially people who you were getting out of the draft were people who had inordinate resources and were trying to run from the draft as opposed to most people who didn't. But you had to make a choice. You had to take risk. Those are different things than the stress you have now. So student loans are terrible, but it's not like you're going to get killed for not paying one. Um, so I do think people have a certain luxury of decisions, but one of the things that I liked about the Occupy movement is it tried to push the fact that and there is, this, whether it's you see that your issue is climate, or you see your issue, as I do, is, is inequality, or how those things come together. How do you not make a decision when so much of it collectively is in our hands, what kind of society and country and world we want to live in, and whether or not there's another one to live in? So yeah, mine may have been a call from the draft board saying, show up at a certain time you know, at the draft center and go through the physical, but yours may be more subtle, but I still think the same question is asked to every one of you, which is, what are you going to do? You really have to do something. You can't ignore that. And for the 40 people in this room, there's 400 that you need to talk to. There's 4,000 those 400 need to talk to. There's 40,000. It's all math. Thanks for that question. OK, there was somebody else raised a hand over here when I saw her at the back. Who is that? Yes, ma'am. Um, that was just a really quick question. Hey. Um, but back to like um, how Acorn is a non or was a nonprofit right, organization, right. so they didn't have to pay taxes. But you said that almost hindered them. Um, and like, why was it a problem that they didn't have to pay taxes? Can you really expand on that? Yeah, and I, I probably was too. It's probably too inside baseball. But here, here's how it works. A nonprofit exists in every state. It's a standard classification for how you set up a defense against corporate liability. So for the first eight years in ACORN, we were not incorporated at all. We were an unincorporated association of groups. If you ever wondered what the legal status of a labor union is, all labor unions 
are just unincorporated associations of groups. In the late 60s and early 70s when I started ACORN, a common tactic was sit-ins, civil disobedience, you got arrested. The year I, last year I ran Massachusetts Welfare Rights, we had 473 arrests. Because you'd sit in, try to get in demand, they'd arrest you, you know, it'd be, to, you know, whatever. But by the early 70s, that wasn't a popular tactic to get arrested. But you wanted to be unincorporated because they couldn't take an injunction, if they took an injunction to stop you from doing that action, they had to name every single person if you were unincorporated. If you were a corporation, all you had to do was take out an injunction and you had to stop. 1978, we were obviously going to some of those states I showed on the picture. We could, you know, we needed that kind of protection because we could no longer keep up with everybody, so we became a corporation. But we just became a nonprofit. Being a nonprofit simply says that you don't distribute any income to officers or board members. There are no profits. So it doesn't mean that you can't make money. If that money is dedicated, for the purpose of the organization, you don't have to pay taxes. If you spend your money, you don't have to pay taxes. So, but if you ever made a gazillion dollars, you'd have to pay taxes. Your nonprofit means you don't distribute profits. Tax exempt is the problem. A C3 or C4, labor unions or a C6, C5, they don't have to pay taxes on their revenue. The exchange for getting usually rich people's money or foundation money or whatever as a C3 or C4 is that you're not going to get involved in politics. You have to be educational, charitable, for health or other social welfare benefits. All of which in ACORN did, but we weren't willing to say that our members, God knows, the membership organization might not be political. So we never became C3s or C4s. Once you do that, you can't be involved in the kind of thing we're talking about, the working family party. If he was asking me that, and I was part of a 501c3 organization, I'd have to say, well, you know, I read in the paper, I think this or whatever, you know, whatever, but we built membership organizations that were democratic. If they raised their hands and wanted to do something, we did it. I was never going to be in a situation where from the back of the room, as the organizer, I was going to have to say, oh, gee, I know, I know you really want to go after that mayor, or you want to go propose that person in an election, but you can't do that because ACORN is a 501c3 because we want to get, you know, money from somebody. So. Is that clear? Yeah. But the knee jerk, if you were going to be an organizer tomorrow, the first thing most people who don't know a damn thing about organizers will tell you, honey, let you go get yourself 501c3. For 501c3 lets you get foundation money. Young rich people give some money. You need to get yourself 501c3. If you don't get some 501c3, you need to find somebody got one of those 501 c 3 Blah, 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 blah. And every organizer is told that, and some of them, you know, just buy that. And it's just a bunch of baloney. Next question. Now you know all about tax status. Come on, don't let her intimidate you. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Um, do you see our political system changing anytime soon, like our two-party system and just how all that works? Because I think a lot of progressives use the excuse of the system being, you know, like really fucked up and oh, I'm just participating in my own oppression by voting anyways. As, as I'm doing what? I'm defeating. A lot of progressives. Yeah, yeah, I heard that part. Then what did you say? Oh, um, we're like participating in our own oppression by voting and stuff. They just don't like, they use that as an excuse not to vote. So do you see a change in that brings us more potential change or anywhere that could like actually, you know, like a, a rough leader thing happening, but, you know, actualize. I thought you said, did I see potential change happening? And then all of a sudden you confuse me and say a Ralph Nader thing. Now, you know, now I don't know which, Sorry. there's so many questions you're embedding here, but look, I couldn't wake up and go to work every day if I didn't absolutely believe that change was not only possible, but inevitable. Now, what it takes to get you and millions of others like you to see that is a different question. It's not all voting, but I, I hope you're hearing me say is voting is a tactic. It's just another one, you know, weapon in our arsenal if we have organized people who are willing to struggle and fight for change and justice that we can use. And that's how we use minimum wage fights, that's how we use, you know, statewide initiatives around banning taxes for food and medicine, you know, whatever it might be to consolidate our base and build power. Um, but that's, uh, it's out of building a base of collective activity 
that you'll have political parties and political movements start to build. Um, and, you know, for all the problems of our brothers and sisters in the Working Families Party, it's exciting that people in New York and a couple other states have an opportunity to stand together in a different way. Look, I live in Louisiana. Um, so, I could not vote, or I could vote for what? Mary Landrieu? As, uh, you know, my standard bearer? And, I mean, she's so close to the oil and gas company, she literally has a, you know, the handle of a gas pump is in the back of her head half the time. But, you know, what am I going to do? Organize every day. Politics is just part of it. Until we change the way people move on the ground, politicians are still going to go the other way. Oh, my buddy at the back again. Come on now. The bottom row is falling down. Well, so I do believe that, and it's because I think you can build sustainable organizations. I just think it's harder and it takes more time. So, three years ago, uh, October 15th, we, we bought a fair trade coffee house in New Orleans, which 5% of the gross, it's a social enterprise, 5% of the gross provides a subsidy for all of our organizers in Latin America. Uh, because we don't bring in the dues income sufficient to support them. Um, Social Policy Magazine, uh, we, you know, doing these books, whatever, all of that come together uh, means that we have the ability to support these organizing efforts in developing countries. Now, when we're organizing in developed countries, France, Italy, Prague, uh, England, Scotland, we, we're working with them to build those resources. Acorn International doesn't have to put money in to help something grow in the United Kingdom. I mean, our dollars are like pesos over there compared to the pound. We got no money. You, you know, when you go over there, you just, you know, you jump on the tube and it's like four and a half dollars in the U.S. I mean, so we don't subsidize them. If anything, I'm hoping they subsidize Acorn International at some point. But you know, there are ways. What we found that was, and we found it early in 1971, we didn't have any money. So we could go out of business. We, you know, didn't know people in New York. We didn't, you know, there wasn't some sugar daddy out there sending dollars or whatever. So we only had one choice. We could go to our members. We were winning issues in Arkansas. We could go to our members and ask them to pay dues, or we could go out of business. Well, believe me, the first couple of months and weeks, I mean, you know, I remember getting paid $23 a week, $32, $38, I mean, you know, you were eating what you kill. Uh, but if you believe in the people you're organizing, and if they believe in the organization, what happens is that, yeah, it turns out they were glad to pay dues. And in fact, the lower income the group, and this, the organizers were just, couldn't figure this out, the lower income the group, the better they pay dues. So I really think that uh, part of the problem is our imagination, and part of the problem is whether or not we're willing to ask people to support things they believe in. And I think, you know, I don't know what it is about the middle class in this country or whatever about not asking for money, but it takes money to run these kinds of organizations. And if you don't want to, I mean, I would much rather ask our members who win things for money to support the organization and somebody who's rich who I don't know who doesn't care about what we're doing. I mean, it's actually, that's an easier ask for me, and I think it is for everybody. You can only grow as big as your resources are. That's the unfortunate fact. So we do have to, you can't just run it based on small coffee houses, but you can build sustainability through a number of different sources so that if you, you know, uh, are able to build an organization, you can support it. Uh, 
not being a student here uh, and having not been a student for about 50 years, when, it, when we were students, there were a number of organizations in the community and on campus that were effective and working hard every day uh, building organizational models. And I wonder if students here would tell us what the uh, organizations, the opportunities are on this campus for you that you know about, that you might be involved with, that are effective uh, either here on campus or within the New Paltz community. I'd be interested to know if there are any. Right behind you, somebody's going to answer. Um, well, we are actually co-founders. Um, we just got it chartered. It's called it's a club called Social Pioneering Monthly, and it's a monthly zine, which is like a grassroots magazine. And each month is a different social issue that we like we vote on, and whoever wants to vote votes on, which we think needs more awareness on, and consists completely of all different types of submissions. Um, so any kind of art or creative writing, or poem, or photo, or something relating to the topic to kind of stir some, it's, it's more eye-catching, I think, um, instead of just like a typical article, which nobody, not nobody, but not many people want to just pick up and read. So it's combining social awareness with the arts. Um, we just finished our first month, which was October, and uh, it was called Corporation Corruption, and we had about 20, 22, 22 submissions, which is really good for the first month ever. And and now this month is called um, manufacturing, so it's kind of about the behind the food industry, all like the deception and like kind of you know false advertising and GMOs and all that. So that's that's one example, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, um, I don't know a lot of details about the rumors, but I know I heard um, about um, registered voters, similar to some of Acorn's work. I know in the past um, semester they registered at least, like, I think the, they report to Senate, I think 200 students at least, they had different, you know, more and more each time. So they're doing some of that type of work in community organizing. But it's very, I think, it, again, it has to be somewhat um, apolitical. Right, it's got nonpartisan registration, that's what we did. And probably the student association could, you know, obviously Toby's willing to sign up for one of these groups, so now you've got to recruit if I don't know, he seems to be volunteering. Was there a, yes ma'am? Um, I have a question. Was, I'm glad you brought that up about this, like, community organizing and about backing when you were in school, uh, kind of work. What do you recommend in terms of, um, like, a plan of action for folks to take in order to achieve their goals and even make them achievable? Like, what would be some general advice? In general, I think you have to know who you're trying to organize. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to do the outreach to that constituency. You have to be very good at listening to hear what the issues that constituency <coughs> has. And you have to be persistent in following up on whatever plan you make until you win. Yes? Um, uh, for a campus environment where, you know, the constituency is rotating on a four-year basis, five-year for some students at New Paltz, um, how would you, like, what is a strategy that an organization that dedicated to social change could use to kind of, like, bridge that gap with the rotating leadership and constituency. But I feel like a lot of organizations and movements on campus lose a lot of steam because they don't have that consistency. So I don't know if you have any experience with campuses and campus organizing, but would you give any advice on that? I mean, clearly uh, my experience in campus was brief. Uh, I think I've already, I mean, I've already been busted about, well, when did you leave and how did you leave? I mean, I, I went to school and left pretty quickly, so I don't have a lot of experience about campus organizing, but there are a lot of transient, I mean, we organize tenants who are very transient in some countries. They aren't in Toronto, they aren't in, you know, some in Rome, but in many countries uh, they are. Um, one of the advantages of having people not connected to an address anymore, but through cell phones and e cell phone numbers that go with them, email addresses that go with them, is that you can actually keep 
keep track of people's mobility and organizing much more effectively now than you ever could in the past. So that uh, part of what fascinates me about students is whether or not you can start mobilizing that sort of time and energy even while people are in school around a diverse number of issues. So when you take something like the remittance justice campaign that we did, the, if you went on our website with Acorn International, the first three studies were all done by students at George Brown College in Toronto that was essentially a college there is more like what we would see in the U.S. as, as a junior college, like a community college, right? Yeah, so it's a, a two-year associate's degree. But they all had to do a community practice, and that practice meant that they could work with real organizations, and they did a great job. And one of them has ended up in Buenos Aires, and you know, another one has ended up in Mexico, and we've been able to keep up with some of them. They didn't necessarily become organizers, but that's part of why I say, yeah, there's some people who can become organizers, but there's everybody who has a role they can play. And, you know, many of the things we don't know from the outside have to do with projects. I mean, right now, I've got uh, four interns from the University of Ottawa who are doing tremendous research for us in terms of uh, trying to figure out the canal project in Nicaragua, where we have a group that wants us to organize. And, you know, one thing after another, a mittens race between the UK, where we just started, and elsewhere. So I do think there are this doesn't address your question, how do you deal with a campus issue, but it does address how you start looking at the rest of the world, even while you're on campus, and how you can transition from some of the very things you're doing in class to see the impacts of those things and connect them into other organizations as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question. So this, I know there's been a lot of buzz in the media about what's going on with the Ebola epidemic. So I just wanted to know what your views on organizing and mobilizing against that issue that's now ravaging um, communities in Liberia and other surrounding. Like, what would what do you feel would be a plan of action? I know that's like a very kind of loaded question, but I kind of wanted to hear your perspective. The uh Now the problem with this issue is it's fairly isolated in reality. And the infection potential of it is actually way blown out out of proportion. So if you were talking about how we would organize in Western Africa or how we would organize people around the rest of the world, around the rest of the world, people need to chill. Right, it's definitely sensationalizing. Yeah, yeah. so you know, part of what we do is in, in all the countries we organize, I mean, I'm going to Kenya and South Africa in January, partially because it's easy for me to get there now because they're, they're killing the economy of Africa. The flights are so cheap. I haven't been able to go in the last year or two. It's been moving towards $2,000. Now I can go in January for a little less than a grand. So it's, it's people don't go into Nairobi, which is in Eastern Africa, not Western Africa. There's no Ebola there. We're organizing in Korogochu, which is the second largest slum in Nairobi. And part of you know what I think we have to do is just let people realize and understand that this is an issue that has to do with the fact that these countries have gotten the support to develop an infrastructure. That's the issue. This infection is just the publicity. It's terrible in these places. I mean, 225 healthcare workers have been killed in Western Africa already. That needs attention here. Um, so I would look at what are pieces of that issue that communicate effectively to people about the healthcare workers that are coming from here over there? But Liberia has been a very difficult issue. We had a number of, of Liberians who transplanted to the U.S. who tried to work with us to build an organization there, and they just couldn't, you know, come up. We couldn't come up with the people and resources to do it. So it's been a challenge. And that was years ago. That was the last two or three years ago, way before Ebola. Right. And you know, politically and economically, it is um, very impoverished. There isn't enough resources. And um, I just had some insight on, on what's going on. And the governments there aren't really doing what's necessary to make sure that the problem is contained in quarantine. So it's, that's partly why I asked the question. I guess I could have been more specific. But if, if you don't have the resources, does, will the problem 
do you feel like the problem is just going to continue to get worse? Sure. Or, I mean, is there, is there something that they, like, is there something that could be done in order to diffuse the situation, even if those resources aren't going to be available? Well, I mean, there's no way you can ask a community organizer if one of the first things they did in Monrovia was to take the largest slum and try to just quarantine that entire slum. You knew that was wrong. But unless you had people on the ground, there was nothing people could do other than resist the Liberian government's attempt to quarantine them, which actually spread the epidemic more. I mean, why the government there and the president acted in that way is very difficult. And, you know, part of the problem there is the same, same transactional problem written way past the ball game we're involved in, because, you know, the credentials of the president from the World Bank and her ability to get uh, foreign direct investment in the country, and now that's also crippled, so you just, you have this sort of waterfall of problems. That's, that's way outside of my scope, I think, at this point. But if we were talking, you know, as a case study of how you might have done things differently, good luck with that same thing. So one of the things we were going to do, I don't think we did it, is anybody who, here's how you can get a hold of me if you want to. If you have other information, other ideas, keep the conversation going. You've been looking at it for this last period of time. If anybody wants more information on Acorn International, all of this up there. We also have the three books that uh, you mentioned. Uh, up here, if anybody's interested, pretty much 9.30, I mean, pretty much my rule in every meeting is after a meeting has gone an hour and a half, it's a dangerous time. People get cranky, they ask questions that are off, you know, it's none of the questions so far off the wall, but I don't know what might be coming next. So pretty much 90 minutes, I think that's enough. Um, anybody who wants to talk to me afterwards, I'll, I'll talk as long as you're interested, but I'm going to let people start to walk out the back door, and I think it's about time to break the final presentation. Thank the Student Association again. Thank my friend Jesse again.